Thanks for staying up later. The Pulitzer Prize winning author David Halberstam is with us, uh, and you're probably familiar with at least some of his work, uh, The Best and the Brightest, about uh, the group of people that uh, put together the policy which steered us and then kept us uh, in Vietnam. The Reckoning was a recent one. His newest book is called The Next Century. But where we're going to focus here is on the coverage of war. And you may have seen uh, Mr. Halberstam on a variety of programs, including Nightline, over the past several weeks, commenting on uh, the way the war in the Persian Gulf has been covered. It's a lot different than uh, the days when you were running around rice paddies in Vietnam along the way to writing a book called The Making of a Quagmire. You were one of those who saw earlier than most that this wasn't going to work out anywhere near the way the administration hoped it would. I was, I mean, it, the irony of it, that you start off with this war and you have in this new wired world 700 journalists there. When I was a young reporter in Vietnam in 1962, there were six or seven of us, so there was a great deal more freedom. We could move around, and then reluctantly and almost inevitably, most of us came to an early pessimism about that war. The common understanding now about the relationship between uh, politicians, the Pentagon, and the press in Vietnam is that the press was knowingly misled at every turn. But to what extent do you think it was possible that some of those generals, some of those politicians, could have actually been giving you and your colleagues their best understanding, but they just, in a muddle-headed way, couldn't see the big picture? Because some of those skirmishes, in objective military terms, were being won by U.S. forces, but they just couldn't see the quagmire that you saw early. When young men are in your command are dying and putting their lives on the line every day, if you don't inform yourself well, um, there's no excuse for being wrong. It's just an unacceptable... I always thought that General Harkins, who was the chief American general there, should have been court-martialed. And I used to say that, uh, because he either was a liar or a fool. And, and I watched him single-handedly go after those American officers in the field who were reporting accurately that the war was being lost. I'm afraid you're getting some anger out of me and you're stirring long sleeping demons but i mean my sources were very good field officers captains majors colonels who put their careers on the line to report that we were not winning the war and when they did that paul d harkins and some of the men who followed him wanted to court martial them so i almost take no prisoners on this issue because young Americans were dying. I think the first thing that, and I sort of like General Schwarzkopf in contrast because he patterns himself, like the generals, he patterns himself after Creighton Abrams, who I thought was a good earthy general. And I think he has that sense that if you are sending young men to battle, that is the most precious resource America has, and you dare not be anything but candid, and you dare not indulge in self-deception. I mean, I, they may have been indulging in self-deception. I find that equally intolerable, along with lying. I, I am very hard lying on this. Regardless of how somebody feels about this particular war, wouldn't you agree that it's a glib analogy uh, to say, this isn't going to be another Vietnam, and to define the problem in Vietnam as we made our boys fight with one hand tied behind their backs, or to take the other side and say, this is going to be another Vietnam, here we go again. It seems to me that the two are not completely parallel. Not only was that war prosecuted ineffectively, but you'd have a very hard time making a case that there was even a good objective if you could have accomplished what that objective was. Because even if you could have won in some, in some conventional fashion, that regime would have collapsed within years, certainly, if not within months, so there was nothing worth doing to be done there. And they didn't threaten anything. You're pretty good, Costas. You're okay. Robert Q. Costas, okay. Um, Ho Chi Minh, trying to expand his country and complete his country's nationalism, 
The more the average American person saw of that, did not think of Ho as a threat to anything, I mean, beyond his own region. I mean, it was not a great aggressive power. It was traditional Vietnamese nationalism. In addition, American technological power, which was how we were going to fight, fight that war, was utterly inapplicable there. I mean, you could blow up the same bridge every day, but they had no tangible power. They could move at night, and they, I mean, and one of the things, people say that television overcovered the Tet Offensive. Effectively, television, in fact, gave a sense of our fighting being more effective there than it was. Because what we really always covered was where the Americans went. And they covered victories. We won the battles. It never showed what the other side did well, which was recruiting at night, moving down the Ho Chi Minh Trail at night, moving into little groups, carrying weapons up and down mountains 18 miles a night. I mean, they, we never saw their dynamic. So tr you go over and you look at Saddam Hussein, and he is not Ho Chi Minh. He is a far more threatening figure. He threatens a region. He uses weapons that have never been used before. Uh, he has a huge uh, uh, army, a huge defense bill, $18 billion a year. He is rolling the dice, in effect, to have even more oil resource to move it up. That's a different equation. I think the more the American people, the average person, looks at Saddam Hussein, the more the person is going to think, well, in fact, that is a rather more dangerous man. So it is a different policy, and in fact, there are more targets with which to use American technology against. But nonetheless, having said that, I think it's going to be a much tougher war than people think. I think the limits, anybody who's ever been a part of Vietnam or studied the war in Korea, or even World War II, has a sense of the limits of air power. Now, obviously, these, this new technology, the bombs, the smart bombs, they're smarter than anything we've ever had before. But there are limits. There finally is a moment when people are going to have to get there on the ground and fight. People on both sides of this but issue. But can I, can I say something? Yes. The, one of the things that drives me crazy is when Bush says, this is not another Vietnam, this is going to be quick. And the reason is that the people who were the architects of the Vietnam War thought it was going to be quick. They really thought that when the first American bombers flew overhead, that the VC and the NVA would give up. And the other thing that drives me crazy one is when he says, we're not going to fight with one hand tied behind our back. We didn't think we were fighting with one arm tied behind our back when we went in. We sent in 500,000 men. And the heaviest bombing in the history of mankind by a factor of two and a half against a little peasant nation, there's a man named Otto Furbinger, who was the managing editor of Time magazine in those days, and he was a hawk's hawk. And he went up to Cameron Bay, where we built this huge naval installation, and he turned to Frank McCullough, the Time Bureau chief, and he said, I know how to get this war over with in a week. And McCullough said, how, what's that? how do you do that? And, and Furbinger said, get the top five VC generals over here and show them this, and they'll surrender. I mean, Cameron Bay is now a warm water port, port for the communists. I mean, I mean, we never understood their dynamic. And Bush, one of the things that is bothersome about President Bush today is a sense that while not dealing with what happened in Vietnam and why we lost may turn out as it was for President Reagan and President Bush, to be good politics, it is bad history. You worked with Peter Arnett in Vietnam, and there's a, a passage in Neil Sheehan's book, uh, A Bright Shining Lie, where you come to Arnett's rescue. Apparently there was uh, some protest yeah. by some Buddhist monks mm -hmm. and a plainclothes South Vietnamese about policeman. Ten about ten they knock Arnett to the ground, and they're yeah. kicking him with their yeah. pointy shoes, yeah. and here comes Halberstam, <laughs> like like Clark Kent <laughs> bolting out of the, uh, out of the phone There's booth. a famous photograph of it somewhere, which really shows Peter sort of on the ground and me in sort of a blocking position, like an offensive lineman trying to protect a quarterback, and about five of the uh, Vietnamese Secret Service men beginning to back off. Peter, you know, I mean, those of us who were the young reporters in Vietnam 28 years ago, uh, Neil Sheehan, Mal Brown, Horst Foss, Charlie Moore, who died about a year and a half ago, Mert Perry, that is a club. I mean, it is, we are really bonded, and we remain bonded. And I, the other day when I woke up in the morning to hear Peter 
Arnett live from CNN in Baghdad. I mean, it was so typical. I mean, I've always admired Peter's courage. He seemed then and he seems now to go beyond the limits, certainly the limits I have. I mean, my nerves went after a couple of years in Vietnam. I simply couldn't do it anymore. And I think that happened with a lot. It never happened to Peter Arnett. It was almost as if Peter has an extra gene that allows him to keep doing this. Do you have any misgivings about uh, the course he and his network have chosen? They know the limitations and they have said, all things considered, we're better off having him there. No, I think he's uh, been scrupulous and I think the network's been very careful in labeling things and pointing out to people, um, you know, the circumstances under which he's working. Uh, I have no problem. I would think that if you wired into the American government, into the Defense Department, into the CIA, not what they say officially, they're probably thrilled to have him there. The obvious pluses are that he sends his dispatches out of there and he understands that this information is assimilated with everything else we know with barrels upon barrels, not grains of salt, barrels of salt. We know the circumstances under which he's broadcasting, so he figures that he'll leave it to others mm. to fill in some of the misgivings and some of the stipulations that he can't that he can't put in there. There, there there are a lot of people in america who don't believe we have a right to report from baghdad that american reporters shouldn't report on what american bombs do to the iraqis that it is somehow a traitor is back in the vietnam war when Morley Safer did his story about the, G the Marines setting fire to the hutches in Kamney and, those, and the story went on television, the CBS switchboard lit up that night with people saying, not, not saying you shouldn't have done it, but saying it didn't happen. I mean, one of the problems with America in a war like this is that our mindset is so fashioned by a thousand John Wayne movies and Rambo movies. And Ram I mean, I really have to tell you, I mean, that Sylvester Stallone did not do this country a great deal of good. I mean, here is this, I mean, I'm sure he's not a bad person. I mean, he's, to me, he's a bit of a dope, I mean, because he makes dopey movies that are very successful. But he's a guy who sat out the Vietnam War at a girls' school in Switzerland, teaching there. I mean, come on. I mean, he's not an American hero. And then he does this Rambo guy. And Rambo is a guy who can go in and, in the immortal, in the immortal words of President George Bush, kick ass. And in he goes, and he kicks ass on an entire North Vietnamese regiment. And, you know, no American casualties. Terrific. Well, that's a movie and an image that demeans not just the North Vietnamese who fought there, but the Americans who fought there. I mean, this was a, these were two great infantries who met in battle in a dirty, nasty war. And the Americans fought well, and the North Vietnamese fought well. I mean, it was, I mean, it was a tough war of two great warrior nations. And, I mean, the idea that one Rambo can go in and do to a North Vietnamese regiment what an American regiment couldn't do, it's really disgraceful. That's, I mean, that's so simplistic. It's such propaganda. And it's really the kind of th process that gets kids killed. I mean, that, just like the Wayne movies got kids killed, too. Back to Peter Arnett, another benefit of his being there that's obvious is, assuming he gets out once it's all over with, then we can have the full benefit of his unedited observation. So those are, those are benefits. Well, even, even, even in his inter interview with Saddam Hussein the other day, he was able to state facts in the frame of a question, noting the difference in damage inflicted in Baghdad and to Iraq by the Americans after 10 days of bombing as compared to the eight years, how much heavier it was than the eight years of the Iran-Iraq war. And the question he posed, so you could pick up stuff, how much harder things were. Okay, now stipulating Arnett's excellence and all the benefits of his being there, isn't there a legitimate concern that despite all of his skill and integrity, that given these circumstances, he can be used as some sort of electronic bulletin board by Saddam Hussein, and therefore we have to be wary of this. Well, I mean, are the people in the American reporters in the Saudi area, the reporters in Washington, the CNN reporters in, in, uh, in Israel, I mean, are they part of an electronic bulletin board that can be used by the Americans? I mean, truth is a very complicated thing. The color of truth is gray. It's very pluralistic. 
Uh, someone who's serious about being informed on this war watches more than one show. He or she reads more than one newspaper, listens to more than one voice. And I think that there are a lot of voices out there, and I think you can pick up a kind of cumulative truth. And I think it is, that truth is out there. But, uh, you know, Peter Arnett is, only, is not truth. He is one strand of it. Backed at home by resolve, confidence, patience, determination, and continued support, we will prevail in Vietnam over the communist aggressor. As I said earlier, you were among those who recognized first the futility and then the immorality of the war in Vietnam and recognized it very, very early not just before it became the consensus of opinion, but before a substantial peace movement had even begun. This goes back to the Kennedy administration. And JFK, at least gently, suggested to Arthur Sulzberger, who had just taken over as the publisher of uh, the New York Times, that maybe it was time to move this young man off the beat. Huh? It was the fall of 1963. I had been out there for well more than a year. And um, Orville Dreyfus, who was the publisher of the New York Times, had had died, and um, young Arthur Salzberger, who no one ever thought was going to be publisher, was taking over. He's been publisher for 28 years. And he was on his way to the, his first meeting with the President of the United States of America, and he went with Scotty Reston, and he said, uh, Scotty, I'm nervous. What do I, what do I, what do I uh, say to a President of the United States? And Scotty said, don't worry about it. He's going to ask you about your kids, and then you ask him about his kids. So they walk in, and the first thing the president says is, well, uh, what do you think about your young man in uh, Saigon? <laughs> like him fine. You don't think that he's a little too uh, close to the story, uh, do you? No, 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 no. <laughs> you weren't thinking of a transferring him to London or Paris, were you? And said, oh, no, no, sis. Punch, we weren't thinking of doing that. And I was uh, slated to go on uh, home leave about that time, and I got a cable saying, you will take no vacation at this time. You stand there. And that's the best part of the Times, that it will stand up to that kind of direct pressure. Do you believe that JFK would have eventually seen the light? There are some indications that a bit of that light was making its way through the curtains toward him before his death. you think he would have seen it full and steered us in a different direction? Well, I've always thought of a John Kennedy in less than romantic terms. I always thought he was a good, modern, contemporary politician. <laughs> and much too shrewd to lose his precious second term in the rice paddies of Vietnam. I, I think there was a loss of a generation. I mean, he and Lyndon were relatively close in age, but Johnson coming out of Texas with all the virulent anti-communism of Texas, uh, I mean, I, you may not remember, but uh, Adlai Stevenson had been spit on and harassed by the John Birchers. I think he had a, I mean, I think he was more willing to believe in a monolithic communism. I think John Kennedy certainly impaled us more deeply in Vietnam. We went from five or six hundred Americans to about 20,000. It went on the front page of the New York Times. The rhetoric got escalated. But he was really too shrewd an Irish Paul to waste that second term in it. I mean, and he knew. He knew what would happen. I mean, he knew that it could be like the French Indochina War, of which he had been, in fact, quite critical. I think he would have tried to paper it over in 64. He would have run against Goldwater. He would have, I think, won quite handily. And I think he would have tried to find some kind of negotiated settlement out. I don't think that uh, unless a greater effort is made by the government to win popular support, they, that the war can be won out there. In the final analysis, it's their war. They're the ones who have to win it or lose it. This is David Halberstam's latest book, The Next Century, with prescriptions for American action uh, to get back on top of the international heap, or at least uh, pull even with the Japanese and others as the next century approaches. And we'll leave discussion of that and you don't think I'll forget sports. Okay. Summer of 49 and the breaks to the game, sports books uh, that David Halberstam has written. We'll leave discussion of those subjects for the next time uh, he's on the program. He has promised to come back. We thank him for this half hour, and we thank you. We're out of here for now. See you later.